Great. Well, thank you uh, and welcome to our event today. Our event is entitled Healthcare Reform in the Affordable Care Act, a panel discussion. And the future of healthcare reform is an exceedingly timely topic with developments actually happening as we speak. And I'm sure all the panelists are taking rapid notes and adjusting their remarks accordingly. Um, and I'm personally delighted that we've been able to bring together some of the nation's leading experts on healthcare reform to help us navigate the intricacies and consequences of these impending changes. What will the current administration's effort to repeal and replace mean both in terms of the policy's content, but just as importantly for the health and health care needs of Americans and millions of Americans today? Our esteemed panelists are precisely the people who can help lead us down this path and provide answers and frames for understanding the changes that are happening around us. Um, before we get on with what you're all waiting for, the actual presentation, I have a little bit of housekeeping. Um, first of all, this event would not be taking place without the generous support from the Institute for Health, Healthcare Policy and Aging Research, the Center for State Health Policy, with additional support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Sociology Department located within Rutgers School of Arts and Sciences, and the School of Public Health. So we offer a thanks to all of them for helping make this event possible today. Also, a sincere thank you to the staff from the Center for State Health Policy for their astute skills in planning and organizing this event, and also to the staff of the Heldrick for helping to accommodate our logistics and provide uh, food and uh, seating and lights and, and sound to help the event take place as smoothly as possible. Um, at today's event, we absolutely welcome audience participation, but we'll keep that until the end. We welcome a, a lively Q&A toward the end of the session after the panelists have spoken, and there will be a microphone passed around. So please do speak into the microphone because the event is being recorded. And the good thing about that is that you will all receive a link to the recording so you can share it with your colleagues, with students, and with others who couldn't attend today. Also, um, sh very shortly following this event, you will be receiving an online survey from SurveyMonkey um, to provide feedback. And given that we have a lot of social scientists and people who rely on data in this room, I look forward to a 99.9% .9 response rate to the SurveyMonkey survey. So those are all the housekeeping points. Um, and now I am honored to introduce um, the host and really the uh, mastermind of today's panel, um, Joel Cantor. Um, Joel, who many of you know, is the Distinguished Professor of Public Policy at the Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy, and is also the founding director of the Center for State Health Policy at Rutgers University. Um, Joel is a nationally recognized expert on health service delivery and the regulation of private health insurance markets. And he frequently serves as an advisor on health policy matters to the state, uh, New Jersey state government, and is also a regular speaker in the mass media commenting on these issues. And how did this panel come about? Well, in the days following the November election, a feeling of real uncertainty about the future loomed, and emotions ran high, regardless of where someone is sitting on the political spectrum. And Joel right away recognized this feeling of uncertainty. And he also recognized right away that we as a community of scholars and practitioners and policy experts need to move forward in the way that we best know how, which is drawing on data, professional experience and expertise so that we can try to understand the changes that are happening around us, and specifically those changes as they bear upon health care and health care reform. So with that, I'm happy to turn over the podium to Joel, who will introduce our speakers and kick off what I hope will be a highly informative and thought-provoking discussion. So Joel Cantor. So you forgot to introduce yourself. So, well, we need more than your name. This is Debbie Carr, who is um, a uh, professor of sociology uh, and currently the interim director of the Institute for Health. And um, uh, I should say the bios are available to you. And I will now introduce our, our panel. Uh, I won't go into all the details here, or we would take up an hour or more just with introductions. But we are really extremely fortunate um, to have uh, some of the nation's leading experts on uh, health reform, health policy, um, uh, at the federal and state level, and uh, also in private markets. Um, uh, we um, would also, I guess I should also thank um, the House of Representatives for setting us up so nicely 
uh, today to give us something to chew on. Um, so I'll introduce the panel, and then um, my plan is for me to shoot questions at them. I also am encouraging them to um, ask each other questions, chime in. We'll try to make it a conversation for the first uh, 45 minutes or an hour uh, of the session, and then we will open it up uh, to que questions uh, from the group. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me introduce um, um, uh, Michael Guzmano uh, is a fabulous new recruit to Rutgers. Uh, he's an uh, associate professor uh, in the School of Public Health. Um, Michael is a, uh, a political scientist, prolific scholar, uh, who's done fascinating uh, international comparative work and um, just really tremendous work on the, the politics of uh, health and health reform uh, in, uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, Heather Howard, a colleague uh, from Princeton University, Woodrow Wilson School, um, comes to us with uh, fabulous credentials as a health policy expert, trained as an attorney, uh, has worked as an attorney, and now uh, is running uh, programs for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to facilitate state engagement uh, in, uh, in health reform. And as you know, states have a tremendous responsibility for health reform implementation in, in, in some of the um, uh, reform plans that we're uh, looking at, that responsibility and maybe we have to put that in quotes, I don't know, uh, will likely grow. Uh, also, Im importantly, uh, Heather brings uh, a lot of uh, New Jersey knowledge to the table here, too. She is our former uh, Commissioner of Health and Senior Services, and uh, before that uh, was Chief Policy Counsel in um, Governor Corzine's administration and uh, Chief of Staff, right, to Senator Corzine. I uh, worked for the Domestic Policy Council, advised uh, former First Lady, uh, what was her name? Oh, right, Hillary Clinton. Um, so she has deep roots in these issues uh, and, and deep knowledge of, uh, of New Jersey. Uh, and so we'll try to, I was asked in advance, will you be talking about implications for New Jersey? The answer is absolutely. Uh, next, uh, uh, my privilege to um, introduce Mark Pauley who is a uh, professor in, at the, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, a health economist, um, really one of the nation's leading health economists, and I would say in the field of healthcare and health insurance markets, the leading uh, economist. He's the guy we all cite in our teaching, um, has done tremendous work, um, a prolific body of work on issues like tax credits for health insurance. So it could not be more timely to have uh, Mark here at the table um, to talk about what are these kinds of reforms actually going to do in the marketplace and what can we expect. Finally, uh, but not least, Sarah Rosenbaum uh, from um, uh, she, uh, uh, George Washington University. I was thinking uh, as I was preparing to give the bio that George Washington may be the president whose name is on more buildings than our current president, but perhaps the only one. Um, so anyway, George Washington University. Uh, <laughs> um, professor of health law and policy and founding chair of the Department of Health Policy. Uh, there, Sarah has uh, been advisor to many presidents uh, and um, many congresses over the years uh, was uh, deeply involved in health reform efforts during the Clinton administration, uh, is, is known uh, as perhaps the leading expert on questions of policy questions related to Medicaid and the safety net and vulnerable populations. So if you want to know more details, uh, uh, read their bios, but why don't we, um, why don't we launch right in? So, Sarah, I'll start with you. Um, uh, you. You know, when we prepared for this panel, I had, we, we talked about very broad questions about what's going on, what's Congress likely to do. We kind of know a little bit more now. And, and um, uh, I, we were actually trying to stream this into the markup so they could get our advice as we go, but we haven't gotten that technology down. But if we were there, um, uh, maybe the best way to frame this is if there were uh, uh, say five things you could change in the current proposal. 
in um, that specific, specifically things that address the needs of the neediest populations that, that you study. Um, and, to, and to be fair and balanced, if there are some things in the law that you want to point out as uh, progressive in the sense that they give us um, a chance to think about things that might be good for those populations. So um, maybe it's not an equal balance, but uh, why, don't, why don't you take it from there? Great. Thank you so much, and thank you very much for having me today. Um, so you want me to identify the things in the current proposal that I would change? Right. As opposed to the things that I think are good? Yeah. There's nothing that I think is good. <laughs> so there's really nothing... On that side of the ledger, okay. I don't think there's anything to say. Well, but, at least I've been fair and balanced. <laughs> well, I mean, I actually consider myself a reasonably fair and balanced person, um, but the, the, the proposal that, that is being considered now um, is, is designed, I think, very much uh, with an eye toward withdrawing government's role in making insurance accessible and affordable to people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am a strong believer and you know, have worked in, in Washington now for over 40 years and have worked with many, many colleagues across the political spectrum who all saw a, a, a most important role for government in making coverage affordable and accessible. So that certainly is not a political dividing line, but the, if you look at the bill uh, as it's now being de debated in two committees, uh, and uh, as I was coming here, I just finished a long blog on the Medicaid provisions for health affairs, sent it off to Chris Fleming at Health Affairs, and in comes uh, what I knew was going to show up this morning, which was an update of which two big trades uh, the Speaker's Office made to get the Republican study group mm -hmm. members on the bill. Uh, so we'll see some more changes beyond what, what they're debating today. But, but if you look at, whether you look at the private insurance portions of the bill or the public insurance portions of the bill, um, th the provisions are not designed to um, uh, promote access to insurance. In fact, I would say that although nominally speaking, for example, um, uh, the bill would maintain uh, the ban against uh, exclusion based on pre-existing conditions, uh, which is of course a hallmark of the Affordable Care Act and would let young adults keep their coverage through their parents' plans. Um, if you look at the structure of the subsidization and you look at the market reforms that would be in the bill, the bill will essentially squeeze out older, sicker people. So, so nominally, it does keep the ban on pre-existing condition exclusions, but the irony is that the people most likely to need that kind of protection will find themselves without access to the to coverage because they can't afford it anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, there was a, a there were a couple of uh, there are now more and more examples of this uh, uh, taking somebody who's around 55. Uh, with modest income, looking at the value of the transfers that she received or receives under the Affordable Care Act and compare that to the transfers she'll get under the new law and forget about the transfers you or I get uh, mm -hmm. under tax law. I, and I mean the difference is uh, like threefold. Uh, so on that side of the ledger, it's a prescription for um, deeply downshifting coverage for older, sicker people. Uh, who are burdened with, by greater health needs and high costs, I mean, and, and limited income uh, in many cases. And then on the Medicaid side, um, the one, you know, faintly good piece of news is that the bill as it stands does continue to recognize uh, the class of beneficiaries who were created, essentially, who was created by uh, the Affordable Care Act, that is low-income adults. So they would qualify for federal financing, but the, the measure would um, downshift that financing back to the normal federal financing level, which for a number of states could be as much as a 40-point drop in federal uh, contributions. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, again, one of these slate-of-hand provisions that says you can keep the 
enhance funding for any individual who continues to be eligible without a break in coverage after December 31st, 2019, but anybody who's been around Medicaid or any program for poor people with a sh sharp stopping point knows that it's very hard for people to stay enrolled in Medicaid for years at a time. So, um, you know, I, I would say if you read the bill as a whole, what you find at every turn is a tip of the hat to coverage, and then when you read the fine print, uh, essentially a series of shifts in law that actually will probably end up disinsuring a lot of people. We don't have the CBO cost estimates yet, but we will. We will, even if the bill's already passed, right? Yeah. Right, right. So um, uh, let's stay on the insurance market question uh, for, for the moment. Um, so we're shifting from income-targeted advanceable tax credits to age-related, and then there's a, it phases out at a fairly high income level. Um, Mark, as somebody who has really looked at the role of tax credits and tax subsidies in insurance markets, um, uh, you know, we, we, my, my questions are, well, what are these things likely to do to the sustainability and stability of the markets? Um, there's a lot of stock in the bill, or at least rhetoric around, well, this is going to encourage more competition, therefore we'll have better cost containment. Um, more participation of carriers in the individual market. Um, it will end the death spiral of the Affordable Care Act, if, as if there were one. But anyway, could I get, I'll stop editorializing and ask you to, as the expert, to talk about uh, what's, you know, if, if this bill or something like it were to uh, replace the ACA, what, what would you predict for individual health insurance markets? It uh, yeah, so uh, I guess I, I can't uh, help but offer some subjective opinions first on what's going on, uh, which is even though I'm a market-oriented person, I, uh, well, I guess the best uh, uh, example is my wife says, you stopped for a while, dear, but now you're still arguing and hollering back at the TV. <laughs> uh, uh, some of the things that uh, are in the current version do seem to be uh, troublesome, even for a market-oriented person, uh, beginning with, uh, actually, the idea that uh, subsidies, uh, I actually supported the uh, qualitative pattern of the subsidies under Obamacare where it seems sensible to me uh, that you would direct generous subsidies where they were most needed to low income and high risk people and then you would taper off the subsidies for as people's incomes rose and their risk fell and uh, and then also you should uh, uh, take away the subsidies uh, that are currently being offered to a tune of oh, more than 200 billion dollars to probably, I suspect, almost all of us in this room, if we get insurance through our job, we don't pay taxes on that insurance. It's sure worth something. It's worth more to me as time goes on. But, uh, 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 the, and then the and a proposal to um, at least cap uh, the, that exclusion was, I guess, in a draft that I think was around as late as last week. There's still a vestigial remnant. There's the Cadillac tax, but they kick the can further down the road to 2026 or something like that, and it's never going to happen, I don't think, in that form, although uh, hope springs eternal. Uh, the, the one, uh, the one uh, uh, thing that may cheer you up or may not is to reflect on the fact that the uh, particularly if we're thinking of the people who are in exchanges, uh, there are about 10 million people, uh, which is 3% of the population. So um, <laughs> relative to the amount of time spent on C-SPAN uh, <laughs> per capita uh, on discussing this issue relative to the number of people affected, uh, it seems a little disproportionate. Uh, and, and that's because most of us do get our insurance through our employer, right. and we really, uh, our only dog in this fight really is uh, whatever taxes end up having to finance the subsidies, hopefully will will be able to buy a clean conscience by paying them. But, uh, but I think in, the, in the, um, uh, the, the pattern of subsidies, I think, is, um, uh, of course, been a, a main point of debate between those uh, very conservative Republicans who want to take away uh, any uh, elements of income redistribution and those that want to tailor it to need. The final product so far, though, seems to be, although uh, you could characterize it however you want if you're a politician, a kind of a hybrid in that 
Well, there's the slush fund created for the states, which they could use to top up the coverage for the people with incomes just above the Medicaid limit. So you could still have somewhat more generous coverage for the uh, near poor. Then there'd be this level of coverage, 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, depending on your age, regardless of your income. But then that's going to go away for people, start to go away with people for in incomes of 400% of the poverty line. So it's not so different in terms of qualitative structure as what it replaced. It's just talked about in a different way. By the way, it's not flat. <laughs> so that's, so I think that, that's, that's important to know that it's somewhat less than revolutionary. But the uh, uh, unknown uh, question here is, uh, there are really two. One is, uh, no, I guess three. Everything in, to an economist comes in threes. <laughs> One is, what will be people's response to these kinds of tax credits in terms of their willingness to buy insurance? And, uh, and we kind of have the two ends of the spectrum, as Sarah mentioned. For some very high-risk people, the credit isn't going to well come close to uh, uh, the premium, and so they may not be able to afford insurance. And for low-risk people, uh, the credit may be adequate, but it, but since the bill retains the community rating in uh, Obamacare, uh, insurance is a terrible deal for them. Uh, so they're much better off uh, uh, instead of adding four thousand onto the two thousand uh, to just uh, stay uninsured and take a chance. Or at least those people who are predilection to do that may do that. So that's point number one: that uh, that there will be some erosion, I think, of uh, the demand for insurance. Coverage. We'll see what the CBO comes up with at, uh, at kind of at both ends. It is interesting, at least according to our calculations, though maybe this will cheer you up, uh, the, uh, the groups that uh, um, were hit the hardest uh, by Obamacare in terms of paying in more than they were going to get back, well, the one group is the group you always think of, the young, healthy people. The other, though, is older women because uh, they're, they're grouped with older men. We never go to the doctor. Uh, and so we're much sicker, and, uh, so the, and they're much healthier, and uh, so they actually end up uh, overpaying for their insurance, too. But, but they get it back when they're younger. They get it back, they, they get it back when they're younger. Over the lifetime, uh, the, 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 it's uh, not so different. But, uh, but, as a, but <laughs> once you're old, you can't be young anymore. No. They tell me so. <laughs> I guess that's how, how they would think about I it. I told you he was a brilliant scholar. Uh, the, 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 uh, the last two comments I'll make are uh, what's going to, in terms of predicting what's likely to happen. One is uh, the, the old bugaboo of adverse selection. Uh, community rating says we're going to charge everybody the same premium, at least at a given age, regardless of their risk level. For low-risk people, that makes insurance a terrible deal. Uh, they, w they, uh, if they are actually paying the premium, and more of them will be actually paying the premium mm -hmm. under a, a lump sum tax credit, they will say, this is crazy. Why am I paying so much and getting so little? Uh, I'm going to take a chance and uh, drop insurance coverage. And then when they drop out, the, pr the break-even premium has to rise. So this almost seems like a gold-plated engraved invitation to adverse selection. I th I was of the belief that uh, we wouldn't have a death spiral under Obamacare. We'd have a shrinkage, but not a death spiral. But now I'm really <laughs> scared about a death spiral. And then the final point, and this is kind of my sermonette on the subject, uh, what's going to determine the stability of the system in part is, uh, uh, this is also an, uh, 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 a message for researchers here. Um, uh, we need to de develop much better uh, evidence to convince people that uh, paying for other people's insurance is really a valuable thing in terms <laughs> of improvements in their health. Uh, of course, everybody here, I suspect, given their, where they came from, probably takes that as a foregone conclusion. But uh, the great majority out there who are not mean people don't necessarily take it as a foregone conclusion. I had to take an extra 45 minutes to drive here because the bridge is falling apart over the Delaware. Maybe that's where they'd rather put their money. Well, if we want to convince them to put it into health care and even a, um, a, uh, a, 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 a lump sum transfer to the states can do a lot of good if it's big enough, um, we need to convince people much more than we have now that, uh, that uh, health insurance really does improve people's health. 
some of you may know it was actually a kind of a, a knife in my heart uh, the, of the study of the or Oregon uh, Medicaid expansion for able-bodied adults, which uh, failed to find uh, 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 substantial improvements in health for this population, where if you're ever going to find it, you should have found it there. Uh, I still believe there are improvements in health when we have very crude measures of uh, measuring health. Uh, um, uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association has come out with a much better measure, uh, actually lately, but, uh, but, it's, but until we can make the case to our kindly but less health-oriented fellow citizen taxpayers that you're really going to get your money's worth by spending a lot on helping people get health insurance compared to all the other needs, um, I think we're, we're, uh, 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 the, the stability of this program is at risk. It strikes me, Mark, that that's an uphill battle given attitudes towards the effectiveness of institutions generally, government specifically, that anything they do is uh, helpful to anyone but other than those people. But we'll leave it at that. That's a point very well taken. Uh, Mark, before I leave you, I just wanted to um, drill a little deeper on, the, the, um, on one question, and that is uh, clearly the least popular aspect of the Affordable Care Act, the one that really the Obamacare label sticks to is the individual mandate and tax penalties. The uh, proposed um, uh, bill does away with that, interestingly does away with it this year um, bef before there's other things in place that, that might prop up the markets, uh, and replaces it with a 30% um, uh, surcharge uh, on premiums for those who go for more than two months without coverage, so an upcharge. Um, uh, of 30 percent. It seems to me as a non-economist who hangs around with economists that that doesn't square very well with the sort of behavioral economics of incentives. Um, uh, or even the non-behavioral economics <laughs> of incentives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, this is consistent with your comment that we're, you know, on the precipice of a death spiral, but yeah. can you elaborate? Yeah, well, the, uh, you're, uh, I guess in this case, my view is a plague on both our houses. The original individ, uh, individual mandate, I'm in favor of an individual mandate, but the one in Obamacare I think was too puny to be uh, effective. Uh, it may have made a bit of a difference in getting a few low-risk people to hang in there because they didn't want to pay that penalty, but for the great bulk of them, the penalty was so much lower than the uh, cost of a policy that uh, it really wasn't very rational to uh, uh, respond to the penalty when um, in, in conjunction with a number of other market-oriented economists, we made a proposal to the George Bush of the first administration where we had an individual mandate. Our mandate penalty was the premium of the lowest priced qualified plan. So this that's what we like. This one can't fail. You either, you either don't get insurance, pay the mandate penalty, and then we buy the insurance for you, uh, unless you have some uh, religious objection, uh, or you uh, might as well buy the insurance because you're paying for it anyway. Mm -hmm. So both, uh, both devices seem to me to be uh, 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 too weak to make much of a difference, but I certainly agree that telling someone uh, if you don't take insurance now and you let your insurance lapse, uh, you're going to have to pay 30% more when you decide to buy it again. That's sort of directed at the Republican bugaboo of people who wait until the last minute and then go buy insurance and then drop it afterwards. And of course, thank the insurer for paying and tell them the next time that somebody gets sick, they're going to buy insurance again from them. But, uh, but, uh, uh, but it's not much. 30% isn't even a year's premium. So if you save a year's premium, uh, that more than covered your loss. The, the thing that actually, I think, prevented or at least limited adverse selection in the Obamacare was not the mandate. It was the subsidy arrangement, which said that for a low-income, low-risk person, the maximum premium they could owe was tied to their income, which meant that uh, even if the gross premium rose, because for some reason a lot of healthy people quit, what they would have to pay to stay in wouldn't change because it's tied to their income, mm -hmm. and so they would stay in. So there would be right. at least a reasonable expectation of, of stability because 
the key to the death spiral is that the premium rises and drives out the low risk, but if the great bulk of the low risks weren't really paying the premium anymore because they hit their income limit, it wasn't going to drive them out. So, uh, so thank God, uh, subsidy, subsidy actually covers a multitude of sins. I think it says that in the Bible. Uh, uh, but somewhere, uh, somewhere uh, at least the Economist Bible. Uh, so I think that was a lot more important than the individual mandate, but I would favor a robust individual mandate, not only for preventing adverse selection, but also for picking up the evil evils of health insurance who think it'll never happen to them and uh, uh, need, to be, uh, need to be led to uh, uh, realizing that um, um, running around without health insurance is not a reasonable way to live. Thank you. So, um, as, as, uh, and we don't want to obsess too much about this bill because it'll be different by tomorrow. Probably. Yeah, I wasn't sure. To, I was going to go to Atlantic City and spin the roulette wheel, and yeah. see, you know, <laughs> or use a magic eight ball or something. Yeah, and I should note that the two. I, I don't. I don't think I mentioned the, the the two things that the that look like they're going in before the bill leaves the house are probably a work mandate uh, for um, uh, 19th century able-bodied people, uh, and um, I mean it's like language from Dickens. And uh, uh, also um, an end to the expansion funding basically this year. Oh. Thank you for that information. <laughs> for darkening our day. More, yes. <laughs> so, um, Heather, I'm turning to you on. next. So, in the current version of the bill, it seems to me that um, uh, there's a phase in or phase out, depending on your point of view, over a couple of year period, conveniently until the midterms, of, of a variety of things. And in the mix, uh, in the short run especially, but also in the long run, are a bunch of sweeteners for states. Um, and we haven't talked much yet about the per capita caps and Medicaid. And so this, this sort of rambling question, can you talk about the short run and uh, this, is, this is both politics and, and policy, but with all these sweeteners, are we going to get governors on board, uh, enough governors to not stop it, as they've done in the past? Um, and, uh, and what are states going to do with all that money, and is it a wise thing to do? So as a former state official, um, I can say that you know, states love slush funds, and so that will seem... Um, that will seem attractive, and I'll be interested to hear, Michael, how you comment on this. So let's step back a week. So before we actually had the AHCA, and is there, is there a, how are we shorthanding it? Trump uh, care. Trump care. Uh, or uh, ACA, or ACA. It's too complicated yeah. for him. Um, a week ago, before we had actual bill language, what you were seeing, I, I thought, was that governors were really serving as sort of a moderating influence on the debate because you have um, 30, 31 plus DC states that uh, have expanded Medicaid and half of them have Republican governors and, and a group of them have been very vocal in saying don't take away and I would point particularly to Kasich and, um, and Sandoval from Nevada and Ducey from Arizona had been particularly vocal in saying it's working don't take away Medicaid expansion and then you had some Republican <coughs> senators from states that expanded Medicaid, Alaska, Colorado, West Virginia, and Ohio saying we can't vote for something that ends this commitment to Medicaid expansion, or, or maybe not quite saying that, but saying we have grave concerns about that, right? So, so governors, because they're, they have so much at stake and are on the ground dealing with these budget realities, they have to balance their budget every year, unlike the federal government, um, really concerned about what this means. And it's interesting, I, I agree with Mark, we're talking about 3% of the population on the exchanges, but we're talking about a significant population of the country on Medicaid. It's now the largest source of insurance behind employer sponsored insurance. 70 some million. 70 some million people. It's um, the Medicaid expansion has provided over $60 billion in federal funding to the state. So this has been a lot of money coming into the states, supporting safety net institutions, providing obviously providing coverage on a human level, but also supporting safety net institutions, strengthening them. So governors were providing that moderating influence, but as you note now, this bill itself probably has some inducements to try and um, keep some of those uh, governors happy in the short term, you know, those who have terms that end. Who, so pushing out the pain past perhaps, I mean, I'll be interested to hear whether you think that's strategy there um, politically. 
But what's really happening, though, let's not forget, let's not lose sight of what's really happening in this proposal and many others. If you look back at the Better Way proposal, the Paul Ryan proposal, or the Tom Price proposal when he was in the House and chairman of the Budget Committee, is a dramatic transformation of the entitlement nature of the Medicaid program. And what that means is you're shifting risk to the states by giving, by capping the amount of money that is going to be spent on Medicaid. And, and why would the federal government doing? Well, not doing it to be kind to the states. I mean, they're trying to get um, predictability in federal, in federal budgeting by, um, by capping the amount and then inflating, and we can get into the weeds on the, you know, how you inflate it, but it, the advantage to the federal government is you get predictability, but the downside to states is that you've shifted the risk to states, and per capita caps are better than block grants, because at least if um, more people are on the program, the amount you get um, goes up, but it still does not, there's not, uh, the program can't be nimble if you have an economic downturn, you have a public health crisis. So it really is a big uh, risk for states. And I think what you're, what I would worry about unleashing are food fights at two levels. One, food fights between states. Because when you cap funding, you're locking in historic differences in funding. You've got a generous state that's had a generous program. Um, we were. Sarah and I were talking earlier, some of the states that didn't expand Medicaid are going to say, wait a second, am I being penalized because I wasn't historically generous? New Jersey is a historically generous state, and I would, um, at, from New Jersey's, perspective, New Jersey's perspective, would worry that once it's no longer an open-ended entitlement, federal officials will say, why is your spending so much more than the national average? Um, so you've got the sort of the food fight at the, at the national level between states as those formulas get worked out because there will be per capita caps per every population in Medicaid, for seniors and the disabled, for kids, for moms, and what growth rates are built in. North Carolina will argue that my population is aging more rapidly than your state, and we need this kind of accommodation, so you'll have that food fight. Then you also have a food fight in the state capitals um, over a shrinking pool. So as the this is all theoretically married with more flexibility for states, which, again, as a former state official, I think that's great, and the ability to, um, to not, um, there's always, that's a constant refrain about the need for more flexibility, but if it's not married with a funding commitment, then what you're facing are food fights at the state level among um, a lot of vulnerable populations and historic interests, so nursing homes, hospitals, disability groups, all fighting over um, what is a shrinking pie. So everybody loves, I mean, you know, those people who live, for example, through transportation funding fights know that the usual answer is to expand the pie and then you can accommodate the different interests. Here, if the pie is shrinking, how do you accommodate? And, and so this new flexibility is great in theory. Many of us think about things like how do we use Medicaid to, in, to fund inv upstream investments um, on things like housing, and so there might be the theoretical flexibility to do that, but if there's less money, um, I don't know how real that flexibility is. So, yes, there are some would appear to be short-term um, inducements that may, I think the hope would be to smooth this out, but I think the long-term risk, when you think about Medicaid being 25% of a state's budget, um, is, is pretty tremendous from a state perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, you know, noting that New Jersey is, is the number two state in our unfunded obligations, thank God for Illinois. Um, I mean, there were, we're a donor state and we get less back. We get and we get less back. back. So, yeah. what, you know, what does this do to st state budgets more generally? And I would, you know, this New Jersey state budget benefited from the expansion for a variety of reasons. That's and right. And, and the, 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 the expansion is brought in, I think it's about $3 billion a year into the state budget and has actually allowed Governor Christie to, has freed up money for investments in things like um, substance abuse treatment to, to invest in reimbursement rates for substance abuse providers. If, but, but historically, remember, New Jersey is a 50-50 Medicaid FMAP state, Medicaid match state, so whereas Mississippi is at about 78%. So we, I, th I would argue our risk is even greater because in the end um, we would be dropping back to 50% and we've historically been generous in our coverage and that's been the culture, um, but I would not imagine that the state could maintain coverage at those higher levels as, as um, Sarah mentioned, we'll see retrenchment and then if somebody, somebody's income fluctuates, they go off Medicaid after that, um, after that free enrollment freeze then their income fluctuates, and then a year later they come back on Medicaid. 
I don't know that New Jersey is going to be in a position to then cover them um, like we would have historically under mandatory funding. You know, it's interesting. I, I, uh, what you're pointing to now reminds me that I looked quickly at the bill to see whether in the revisions um, the, uh, uh, the drafters had introduced some flexibility around the new adult population, that is, either 138% of poverty or some reasonable subgroup thereof. And the answer is no. States are going to have to make an all or nothing decision even when the federal funding drops. So, really? uh, for example, the state would not be able, as I read the legislation, the state would not be able to say, well, we really can't afford to keep everybody on up to 138% of poverty. We can afford up to 100%. That's not, they did not set up subclassifications. Uh, so I assume that they are not interested in having states take cuts at the population. So what happened to state flexibility? I don't understand. Um, okay, so um, Sarah's talking about the, the uh, amendments that we're seeing now, and it seems to me that those are designed to bring the um, uh, Republican members from the right on board. Uh, with this, the work requirements and the, the earlier um, uh, defunding of the expansion and so on. Um, so, of course, it takes a coalition to pass a bill. As they move to the right with these kinds of amendments, what happens to people like, um, there's 25 or so congressional districts that Hillary won, one of which is here in New Jersey, um, Congressman Lance's district. What happens to him? And I'm getting emails to go march at his office. And <laughs> Anyway, so, um, so let's dig a little deeper into the the question of poly can can they get to a coalition that can pass this even in the House, let alone the Senate? And I well, I'll start. I, I, I never try to get too deeply into the mind of the House of Representatives <laughs> because that I don't think that's there's good no for return. Me. Yeah, it's not good for me psychologically. And I, and I, I did want to begin by so just reminding everyone that, that you know it wasn't this House but the previous House and did vote to repeal the Affordable Care Act, I think, over 60 times. And so the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate are, are very different institutions, as my, my friend Mark Peterson likes uh, to remind everyone, if you want to explain U.S. health politics to people outside the U.S., you only need three words, United States Senate. Uh, and so I, I worry about spending too much time, on the one hand, delving in to, to the weeds on this, because I'm sure things are going to change. On the other hand, I suspect something like this in terms of the broad parameters and direction is going to pass uh, and they are going to come up with a sufficient coalition uh, tweaking it here and there. Uh, I was, I subscribed to a newsletter inside health policy and my, my phone was sort of blowing up over the last couple of days as a sort of new headline saying, uh, you know, conservative Republicans within the House object to the plan, moderate Republicans within the House object to the plan the AMA and the AHA object to the plan. State governors object to the plan. I was trying to figure out who is for this thing. Other Chamber than of Biden. Commerce. I began to feel bad for Paul Ryan a little bit at the moment. Um, but I just, so let me, let me just begin I, I, to sort of reiterate. It's, I'm not going to get too much into the details because everyone's done such a fine job up till now. But I, I really think it's important to revisit this notion that this is a fundamental philosophical shift in the role of government. Uh, the ACA, for all of its limitations uh, and, and problems, really was an effort to shift the U.S. at least slightly, uh, going to my international work, in the direction of what Joe White's called the international standard of trying to cover everyone and sort of operate uh, within a budget, and it really did embrace in many ways, whether it was the treatment of the subsidies or the expansion of the Medicaid program, uh, the notion that insurance ought to operate on social insurance principles. And everything you've heard from Sarah and Mark and Heather uh, just emphasized the fact that we're moving in the other direction. Um, I was part of a panel like this one a couple of months ago before we had any details of what replace might look like. Uh, and we were talking about the claims by the Trump administration that Obamacare was in a death spiral. And I said, well, I, I don't think it's in a death spiral. I'm with you. But if you wanted to shore up the insurance marketplaces, what you would do, as Mark Pauly suggested, is you would 
uh, expand the subsidies and you would also increase the penalties and they seem to be doing the opposite in both counts. And so whatever comes out of the U.S. Senate, which will be different than this, I, I think you're going to see a fairly significant loss of insurance coverage, both public and, and private. But it is interesting to think about um, there are so many strange things in our politics right now. As a political scientist, I'm actually struck uh, by how utterly predictable some of this is. I think the, mm -hmm. the divides and the difficulties uh, in coming up with a plan in the first place was not at all surprising. You have uh, a majority Republican control of both houses and, and the White House, uh, but you don't have a filibuster-proof majority, nor do you have a Republican Party that's completely on board? So there are really important fissures among Republicans. If anything, they look a bit like the Democrats under Clinton as opposed to the Democrats under Obama, where they seem to be able to come together a lot more easily. So I think the difficulty of getting anything done is not trivial. The other thing to keep in mind, kind of going back to, to Heather's point, is uh, First, in terms of the strategy, I think there's no question there are two bits of the strategy that seem important. The, the rush to get this through, in addition to a desire to get something passed before the CBO can tell us what, the, what a fiscal disaster this is, since I don't, I don't see how on earth you can cut a trillion dollars in tax revenue and pay for the things that they're talking about doing. Um, the urge to get this through, in part, is driven not just by that, but I think they would really much rather just get this off the table and hope that the news cycle replaces this so that this is just yesterday's news and the new reality that the, the ACA does not exist in its current form by the time you get around to the, the 2020 midterms. Uh, and there's no question that the sort of uh, pushing off of at least some of the pain, although uh, interestingly enough, not all of the pain uh, till after 2020 is also done. Uh, the Democrats, on the other hand, have been al almost uh, strangely gleeful, even though they've been uh, deeply troubled by the proposal, thinking about, isn't this great that they now have this problem in their hands? They've painted themselves uh, into a box. Uh, uh, someone at that, the other panel, I, I said, uh, the, the, well, the Republicans have a much harder job than the Democrats because they've promised to improve insurance coverage and reduce spending. And I guess from that perspective, they do have a much harder job. <laughs> it is rather difficult to achieve that. Um, an interesting question will be from terms of the general public reaction, thinking of 2020, presuming something like this, at least philosophically, passes, is whether the American public will put two and two together and get four and actually attribute the sort of pain that they're experiencing to the Republican Party. I, I think that is likely to be the case, but I wouldn't take it as a given, mm -hmm. given the efforts to reframe this as we are saving a right. death spiral of the ACA and things were going to get even worse. That is absolutely going to be an important part of the rhetoric and the strategy. Um, however, I don't think the Republican governors uh, or the hospitals or the nursing homes who are likely to be adversely affected are going to buy that logic. And I, and I think it's important not to lose sight of those important dynamics, both mm -hmm. uh, the powerful interests, uh, as your, your colleague at Princeton, Uwe Reinhardt, likes to say, right? Every dollar in healthcare spending is a, a dollar in healthcare income. And so there are lots of people who benefit enormously from the spending of the ACA. This is why it's hard to get rid of government programs. <laughs> uh, and the intergovernmental lobby, arguably, is one of the main reasons why the Medicaid program, shockingly, continued to grow over the decades while Medicare remained relatively static. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we have we've talked about it but not really highlighted it, is what's stunning, I mean not stunning, but really remarkable about this, this proposal, is it doesn't just go after the ACA. I mean, if anything, it's primarily trying to target the existing Medicaid program and fundamentally change the nature of the Medicaid program. Uh, Frank Thompson and I were actually talking uh, just before this about what is the meaning of budget reconciliation? What can actually be included in budget reconciliation? Uh, obviously, changing the Medicaid program with a per capita uh, cap uh, involves taxing and spending. 
Um, but philosophically, anyway, my understanding of what budget reconciliation was supposed to be about was not fundamentally restructuring a program like this, but it is clearly trying to be used to fundamentally restructure a program and change its nature. Well, that's actually a great segue to the question, uh, next question I had in my mind, which is this arcane um, sort of parliamentary thing. I'm looking at you, <laughs> the lawyer in the room. Um, uh, of budget reconciliation and avoiding the need for si for 60 votes, um, and so uh, anticipating that they maybe can get to 51 in the Senate, but but not 60. Um, uh, but at least some of the stuff I've read by Tim Jost and others suggests that maybe some of this isn't likely to be um, well, allowable. Well, so so every, there's like this perfect storm going on. Um, in, in, under the, um, the rules of budget reconciliation, um, which, which I mean, just to make, make it clear to everybody, this isn't like a law that passed and if you violate it, you go to jail. These are made up, these are made up rules by Congress. But one of the most sacred rules, um, which as Michael says, is, is, is you know, done to try and, and prevent actually, um, sort of sneaky end run, using, using a must-pass bill as a way to deal with big items, is this requirement that whatever goes into a budget reconciliation bill has to essentially directly affect outlays or taxes. Mm -hmm. Has to raise revenue, reduce spending. Now, in fact, changing Medicaid from an open-ended financing system to one of capped spending is a direct outlay change so it would go in but here's the rub the governors have said you know we can deal at least some of the governors have said we can deal with this huge loss of funding as long as we have flexibility what they're going to end up with is a perfect storm because all of the changes in eligibility in benefit requirements in cost sharing requirements um, all of the things that are the structural DNA of Medicaid wouldn't survive what is known affectionately in Washington as a birdbath. Uh, so all of the flexibility measures are washed out. And what people have been quietly told, uh, it's hardly a big secret, but I mean, this is what, you know, the sort of quiet, quiet, Washington quietly, quiet, right, yeah, yeah. quietly going on here is don't worry. Secretary Price will use 1115, the big research and demonstration authority under the Social Security Act, to give you all the flexibility you need. And there's a couple of problems with that. The first is that 1115 is demonstration authority. So at the point at which uh, the CMS administrator and the secretary begin using it as simply a means of altering every requirement in the program for everybody who wants one, um, I assume the lawsuits will start flowing to, to stop this. And, and the courts actually, there is some history of the courts intervening to halt uh, demonstrations that exceed the secretary's authority. So that's mm -hmm. problem number one. Problem number two is 1115 is unbelievably complicated and a real burden for states. Um, it's a whole lot more complicated than, um, than state flexibility measures as a, as a state plan operations matter. And number three, there are certain things that I assume states want flexibility over that you can't give under 1115. For example, you can't really change premium and cost sharing rules. There are severe constraints. Uh, work re work requirements? Hmm? Can you do work requirements? Obama. Oh, yeah. The line but, you well, can... yes. I mean, the, Obama, the Obama administration has sort of pushed back on mm -hmm. particularly onerous conditions of eligibility and turned them into voluntary requirements. And their argument actually, um, but you can see the squishiness of 1115 authority, is that the president did not consider it consistent with the objectives of the Social Security Act, right. which is the outer bounds of 1115, um, to essentially um, make people do something called work to get their insurance. Um, in fact, the whole point of insurance was to get people into a position where it would be more possible to work, and there have, been, of course, been studies suggesting that that, that is a, a, a related outcome of having better coverage. But so, 
that's this arcane bird rule is the reason why what is now steaming down the tracks at states is, you know, half a trillion dollars in funding cuts and we haven't even gotten into some of the other changes that are in the House bill. We've talked about per capita, we've talked about the end of the enhanced funding sooner or later, um, but probably close to a half trillion dollars in cuts and no flexibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically states in a position of take it or leave it. You either play a 50 year old game by these new rules or leave the program. So, you know, that's pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. Well, I do want to come back to some of those more, some of those details, particularly as they relate to Medicaid, which as we've said is a much bigger part of the population and the coverage and the safety net and, exactly. and so on. But one more digression into um, private insurance markets, and that is, there is a little bit of a tipping of the hat in the current bill, and I think a lot more rhetoric um, uh, even beyond this bill, that if we could just give the insurance industry more flexibility to design plans, to uh, the selling across state lines is not in this bill, but it's still in the miasmas. Um, uh, and that's the way to bring down Healthcare costs through innovation in insurance and in, 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 uh, competition in insurance. Um, I'll open it to anyone, although nat naturally I would turn to Mark with this question. Is, 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 there, is there a thread of hope that um, spurring innovation in insurance products and so forth is going to help us here? Well, certainly there's room for improvement, although I guess I don't think there's enough there to uh, promise any long-term cost containment. Uh, the, the positive part is uh, there is uh, fairly good empirical evidence that the more competition there is among insurers, the lower the premiums, although a lot of that is from the pre-ACA period. And with the ACA, you have the minimum uh, 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 medical loss ratio, or is it maximum? I can never remember. Uh, but whatever it is, uh, there's only 20% there to fiddle with. So uh, an insurer can't overcharge too much or they, viol they have to give the money back, but uh, uh, there, there is uh, some scope for that. There are uh, certainly a belief on the part of many of my MBA students that they have the world's greatest idea for restructuring insurance, and if you'll just let them give, a, give it a shot, uh, it will actually make people healthier and save money, and some of them might work. I don't want to be uh, negative here. Somebody may invent something that might work, and there are actually some things that even we've worked on to save money and improve outcomes. It's just they don't, <laughs> they didn't cost enough in the first place, so the money they save uh, doesn't add up to so much. But, uh, but uh, so there is uh, some scope for flexibility there, and I guess I'm uh, of the belief that uh, we, I mean, it's, again, it's one of these philosophical divides that uh, one way to think of organizing the American health insurance system is to maximize the opportunity for choice. You want to do that if you think people have very <coughs> different preferences about how they want to get their insurance and how they want it organized. Uh, in Sweden, maybe they all want the same thing, but in the US, it's my impression that people have a lot of different views. Some may be willing to tolerate high deductible health plans, others narrow networks, others uh, capitated arrangements where you're tied to a particular doctor and hospital, uh, even uh, classifying insurance plans by uh, what uh, cost effectiveness ratio they use as the rationing cutoff for adopting new technology. You could have the $50,000 per quality adjusted life year plan and the $200,000 per quality adjusted life year plan and the second one would have a higher premium than the first one. It would be up to you as a consumer to decide what you like. What's the alternative? Well, it's something like the UK where you have a kind of star chamber decide and the whole virtue of markets is not some cosmic uh, moral correctness, I think, uh, although some people believe that, but, uh, but it's that it allows diff people to, um, ex uh, who have different preferences to let those differences be expressed. You know, I so there is, some, there is, I think, some hope for uh, some improvement there, uh, and, and if you are of the school that believes that 30% of healthcare spending is waste, or even the 50% school, maybe you, you really get excited about this. Uh, I'm not, I believe 
waste about 10 percent personally, but uh, uh, but, but uh, uh, at least 10 percent of a trillion do something about it. It's still it's still billions, yeah. but yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, but I think the uh, I guess the, the the direct answer to your question though is I think there is uh, some scope for improving the functioning of insurance markets mm -hmm. if politicians can figure out how to do that and want to do it as opposed to trying to create uh, regulations which they can then use to manipulate political contributions and such. Uh, but, uh, 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 but, uh, but even the most optimistic interpretation, I think, of what you can get out of competition is not a reduction in cost or even a massive slowdown in spending. What you can get out of it is what people end up buying is what they really want to buy for the amount of money they're willing to spend. Is, they is get it, the right it, amount. It may not be uh, the, 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 I, the, uh, uh, what they would have asked Santa Claus for, but it, it's still what reflects what they're willing to pay. Isn't the, um, the, the mechanism of the cost savings under competition really in the dynamics of insurer uh, negotiations with providers? I, yeah, you know, that's what I was it? thinking, that it was really where the money can get yep. saved is the well, that's what, networks. One dimension is you can choose a very narrow network where they've signed up the hospitals they're able to cut a really good deal with. But that's why we're racing the lines doesn't help here, because the reason that insurers don't move into the markets networks. is because they, they, they don't have an intimate relationship with an existing network, and it's hard to create them. Uh, and so you've got this sort of contradictory sense that yes, one way to really you know manage your resources well is through a, a tightly managed, well-functioning network, but it also may be the very reason why you don't have more interstate movement. Uh, uh, it, well, but certainly the uh, narrow network plans are spreading uh, oh, rapidly. Yes, so I, I, there is certainly a cost to constructing a network, but there's. Um, if there's enough money there, you can do it. Uh, the, the main problem is, problem. Uh, is that how do consumers really feel about that? Um, I have tried to propose to my students uh, offering the um, Philly health plan that says, uh, we're not that great, but we sure are cheap. Do you have a problem with that? Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure I would buy that one. Uh, but somebody might. Uh, uh, and uh, so I think there's some scope to do it, but the question is both whether the um, political apparatus would actually let competition <laughs> in full flower break out and, and whether there's enough entrepreneurial nerve to really mm -hmm. pull it off. Some people think there is. So. It's also going to depend on the level of competition and the delivery system where you're negotiating this, because if you don't yep. have a great deal of competition, the, right. the, then if, the if, providers if, are going to have so much leverage that if, there's if, only a limit to what the insurers are going to be able to do. In Western do. Nebraska, you're stuck. Right, exactly. In, in Chicago, in Alaska. Alaska. And as far as I can tell, a lot of the, the flexibility that they want to give to insurance design really has to do with selling lousier insurance. Which, which, you know, to, to well, I don't know what's well, lousy insurance. It's, well, okay. Well, if it's less, sold at a cheap price, less, less insurance with a lower cheap, actual right, right. value. You no, know, no, we're, we're lousy, but we sure are cheap. I think would be the right would be the right phrase. But it feels a, li a little bit like Back to the Future. I remember in the the 1980s, all the rage was we needed basic benefit plans, and that basic benefit plans would be the solution to insurance coverage because if you simply allowed insurers to sell products that did not uh, you know, could ignore some of these state mandated benefits and they could sell insurance that basically covered less and was cheaper. Th this to well, me I, has I, relatively I, little to do with reducing the cost of health care. It has to do with reducing how much insurance you're buying. High deductible health insurance actually is the modern incar incarnation okay. of that. Yeah. And it does save money. Uh, Rand, the Rand health insurance experiment proved that without, for middle class people anyway, uh, as long as you get some insurance, uh, without producing uh, drastic impacts on health outcomes. Although, as I said earlier, I believe there are health outcomes out there. We just can't measure them well enough. But uh, it's, not, it's not the end of the world uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, health outcomes. So I think you want to be careful about how you 
describe insurance uh, uh, because there's a trade-off between the generosity of benefits or the, uh, uh, the, uh, the scope of choices across different providers and the amount of money uh, that uh, you have to pay. And um, particularly for the lower income population, uh, they don't have the same luxury as the rest of us do, as al along with as well the tax subsidy that makes it only cost half as much net for me to choose the best plan at Penn as it actually costs, that there may be some scope for doing that. But, um, uh, uh, and I believe you even uh, reasonably well-off people can be incentivized to be more frugal mm -hmm. uh, in their choice of health care. But, uh, you know, what I tell my students is I guess what I would tell policymakers, you know, create the rules to allow this to happen and then knock yourself out. Well, maybe on that point, I'll point out that you sort of challenged us to find things that we might like in the AHCA, and there is that um, funding for, theoretically, that would go to states to help stabilize markets. And I think what's interesting there is that it's clearly not enough money to do something, yep. but there's a recognition, and I think it goes to Mark's point, um, that, that there are levers if you want to pull them. And I think that's the fundamental question here, is that when you look at a couple, the, the states where the ACA is faring particularly poorly, in Tennessee is the one, and Arizona are, are the two states where people um, point to the lack of competition, and there are some counties where there are no providers. Right. Um, those are states that have not embraced the ACA and where the state has not chosen to get in the game and to try and stabilize the market. But Alaska, um, you know, no beacon of progressive leadership, I wouldn't think, has actually gotten in the game and they established a state funded reinsurance pool to keep their carrier in the market when that carrier threatened to pull out. So um, you know there so I think there are there are tools under the ACA and then the AHCA actually sort of anticipates that there could be a state role. What I wonder is whether some states want that role and want to be in there. And that's the question. Well, whether they've they simply devolved all of the tools that were in the Affordable Care Act to stay right. at a fraction of the funding right. and now have pitted what I, you know, my concern is that um, states will be under immense pressure um, from insurance industry folks, which are under immense pressure not to die, to you know, use their money to do certain things that in the end make, will make Hobbesian choices when in fact you need to do all the things. You need to buy down the cost share and you to bring to make people you know, have access, if it's, if it's wise access. You need to stabilize the insurance industry against high losses. You need to do a number of different things and the funding that, that the bill includes just is not enough money to do that. Well, well I, the insurance industry isn't going to die as long as group health insurance covers 150 million people. There's still right, but the, but but the, the individual but this, market, this boutique okay. market, uh, is yeah, oh, at yeah. risk. Trouble. Right. I mean, we, we keep saying that this, the individual market is small, so we're overblowing its consequences. But it's important as the the place where people go when they're losing Don't jobs, between employment. jobs. Exactly. There's a whole literature on job loss. Yep. Yeah. Right. Well, there's and even so on. there's even a worse issue if you really want to scare small children. Uh, that's in the Republican <laughs> bill, which is to say the they have removed the um, requirement of, that employers offer insurance with a employee explicit premium share that's relatively modest, which means a, a company could cancel its insurance offering. Um, uh, I had a debate with Zeke Emanuel on the Obamacare, and he claimed they were going to cancel their insurance under Obamacare. They didn't because uh, there were uh, provisions carefully crafted in Obamacare rules to make it uh, harder to channel your employees to get the mm -hmm. open at the tax credit mm -hmm. in the individual market, but in the Republican version, yeah, where it is today, I sure hope they change this, but where it is today, uh, there is none, and uh, the logical response of many firms may be to, to simply stop offering group insurance and tell people, especially if there were uh, the credit that they would get is more than the value of the tax exclusion. To well, and the that, small group that. market has been weak the for a long time. The small group market is, right. is but you know. uh, yeah, but that was probably artificial. But uh, mm -hmm. but uh, so, the, but I think the the uh, I was trying to be reassuring at the beginning, saying <laughs> most people here don't have to worry because you got insurance for your job, but you actually do have to worry. Uh, so you know, make, if you wake up screaming at midnight, uh, what's going to happen to my group health insurance? Something bad could happen if. 
what is in the bill actually becomes law. Well, I'm really, my union rep is in the room, so I'm good. <laughs> so, um, uh, back to this question of states um, and um, the, the devolution of um, what I would characterize as, an, as a technically really complex task, not to mention politically, as you say, of assuring stability of markets. Uh, we had a slide in the rotator up front about New Jersey's markets, and you saw our comprehensive plan enrollment go wee, way down. And then we introduced a uh, really hospital, mainly minimum benefit plan, uh, which was enormously popular among young, healthy, particularly men. Um, it was age gender rated. It was attractive to young people. Um, uh, what about, I mean, when I think about New Jersey, we have among the best capacity to, th to regulate and oversee our insurance industry. Um, I could see this working out for New Jersey, but you know, in a state that has three people in the insurance commissioner's office, the insurance commissioner is elected. So, um, well, do that's state. Why go, that's why you go across state lines. You I see. Borrow the regulations from the uh, from New Jersey. I worry that uh, we're going to borrow the regulations from South Dakota. Yeah. It, it goes the other way, probably. Right. Well, well, yeah. well, 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 depends on who's deciding. You work with states, Heather. I mean, where's this? Do I, they? Could they have a clue how to do this? I think you pinned a really important issue, which is yeah. the state capacity, regulatory yeah. capacity. Totally. So I mean, I, I was saying before, maybe states don't want to be in the game, but even if they want to be in the game, do they have the capacity? And you're right, New Jersey has really good folks at, at Department of Banking and Insurance and has a history of regulating and understanding the market. You saw that most under the ACA, most states actually did step in, did not, I think it was six states that, that right? does that sound right, Sarah? Yeah. That did not enforce the new market rules. But even, but you know, I don't know that HHS had a lot of capacity no. to see among those 44 how many were doing a, that substantial job. And the ACA also had grants to states to hire new people. There were rate review grants so you could hire, and those grants have ended. Right. So if there was capacity, that's now gone. And I certainly don't think it, you know, and, and again, back to states having to balance their budgets every year, nobody runs for governor on increasing the state, work, you know, insurance department workforce. So um, I just, I, I, I do worry about that capacity. Um, in some cases, too, I should have mentioned there may be capacity at state universities and there's great partnerships and that. Of course. We see that here in New Jersey, obviously. but. I don't know that that's the case in, in other states. So that's a real issue is that we're devolving to the states where there's just not that, there's neither the interest nor the capacity. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's, it's the politics of this is interesting. In some Republican states, of course, the insurance department is a kind of good old boy set up and the uh, states want to keep it there, but the pure Republican logic would be to say, Shrink, shrink the state's regulatory capacity. That's what we want, mm -hmm. and just kind of have very minimal rules about. That's uh, a strategy. Uh, right? of, uh, it is a strategy uh, of, 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 yeah. of yeah. how to uh, uh, offer insurance coverage. Well, and I think I mean this is an old story about the devolution of authority, and the devolution of authority being mixed up with the overall agenda of reducing the size of government. This isn't just about kind of Nixonian new federalism of shifting resources as well as responsibilities to states. This is about shrinking the resources that are available so that the overall role of government shrinks. But, and, but and let me just add, we should layer on top the countervailing trend of progressive federalism. So I think you will see pushback You've seen that already from New York, Governor Cuomo came out and said. Yeah, you know, California, you know, they, they, California they, they, would, they would love to be turned loose. Well, but, you, I just, but will they have the resources to do right, it? Right, well, what, what, you're going to, what you're going to see, I mean, one of the great ironies of the ACA, given the post-NFIB versus Sibelius, right, was that the, the, uh, the ACA was sort of built on the hopes of actually standardizing Medicaid eligibility in what you see, saw uh, as a result of the, the court decision and different state capacity and willingness was a, an increase in, in, uh, in de deviation w within the states. And you're going to see even more of that uh, given mm -hmm. Heather's point about capacity. So let's, let's go uh, a little deeper into some of the Medicaid issues. Again, the, the 70 plus million people instead of the 15 or 20 million. Um, so, and we do care about them. They're among the most vulnerable in society. Um, uh, and Sarah, you said something that um, I think intrigued me, and that is that we've, we've only begun to scratch the surface of what this bill does in that domain. Could, could you elaborate on what you meant? Yeah, well, again, you know, it's very easy to write a law 
Anybody, anybody who's a lawyer or has been around the legislative process or the regulatory process knows how easy it is to write a law that looks like it's doing one thing when in fact it's doing something very different. Um, so for example, um, um, there is a, uh, a section of the law of the bill that uh, under the heading basically Medicaid program enhancements. Um, that's the title. Um, it's like a productivity adjustment. Well, yes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in addition to the the high flying things that we've talked about now, yeah. the per capita cap, the 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 end to the enhancement funding. So, under um, one of the Medicaid enhancement categories, is forcing states to go back to just in the case of those. Charles Dickens, able-bodied adults, nobody else. Um, redeterminations every six months. Okay. Now this is, of course, the same bill that says the moment that your Charles Dickens, able-bodied adult has a break in coverage longer than a month, uh, you lose your enhancement funding and you are relegated back to normal, normal funding rates. So, of course, the reason everybody's moved away from redeterminations every six months is twofold. One, um, because it turns out, and this has always been the case under Medicaid, that if you have changes in your circumstances, your, your, your earnings go up, one of your children goes away to college, so that affects your household size, things like that, you have to report it. Uh, you have to report it on pain of sanctions if you don't, because it can affect your eligibility. So under normal reporting, when you report that information, you have to have your eligibility redetermined. And what people figured out about the, um, this, the, the, the uh, scheduled redeterminations is that they were a waste of everybody's time, and the only thing they did was to throw people off the program, because people would get notices, they wouldn't understand the notices, uh, they throw the notices away, the notice would never arrive, it's a very you know, mobile population, and then boom, your coverage would stop and it would take several months typically to get back on the program. So in a totally you know, cynical move, of course, what, what, what the House does now is require states, they, they give them extra fe federal administrative funding to do it, but they require them to put people through a semi-annual redetermination process. That's one example. Another very serious one um, is an end to the process of being able to put people onto Medicaid based on their attested legal status or their citizenship status. The way it works today is you go in, you apply, you of course again on penalty of perjury do an attestation of citizenship or legal status. Your coverage begins assuming you meet the other criteria and it goes on you know, for a few weeks while your documentation comes in. If the documentation doesn't come in, you're off the program. No more. Now you have to walk in the door um, uh, with proof of your citizenship when you, at the time you apply. Uh, and of course, um, uh, having, having just moved a 90-year-old mother uh, from Connecticut to, to Virginia, and having gone through being, I am mean, a lawyer, I'm sent away three times from the Department of Motor Vehicles because I failed to come with the right documents uh, to get her, her, you know, you sitting there, this old, little old lady, what does she do? And this is the answer, it's very hard to walk in with documents and to get the documents right. And so throughout the bill you see, you know, what could be thought of as tweaks like this where the name of the game is to withdraw federal funding, make it impossible for states to run a program, um, increase the state burden rather than turn down the flame on the state burden, all under the rubric of Medicaid enhancements. Uh, and I assume that we're gonna see a sort of a parallel set of activities in the regulatory restructuring of the Affordable Care Act that, that has already begun. Uh -huh. um, and, and there are plenty of places in the case of Medicaid where I mean, you really see what it means for different outlooks to run the regulatory state the, or uh, you know, as the administrative state. Um, uh, a whole series of decisions were made in favor of 
making it easier for states, making it more efficient for states. Um, and now we're going to see the wheels under the name of state flexibility ironically turn you know, in the opposite direction. So. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn to questions uh, from the audience in a minute. Uh, we wanted to start up in this corner because I promised the reporters if, that if they stayed for the whole time, they'd get the first question. <laughs> so uh, is there, does anyone else on the panel want to add anything at this point on uh, any of the above? If not, we will open it. Um, and it's not pressure. Anybody? Questions? We're going to use the mic, and I guess uh, one ground rule is please introduce yourself and your affiliation. Hi, Lee Lowe, Stanton from New Jersey Spotlight. Um, this has been very interesting. Um, I was curious about uh, the restriction, as I understand it, to defund any money to Planned Parenthood. Oh, yeah. And I, I'm confused as to, I, I wasn't clear if that was just the Medicaid portion or whether that applied to the any plan that had any subsidy and how that worked, does that start in 2020? So, yeah. Sure. So the way the law war, the way the law is written, effective upon enactment, so if the law is signed on April 15th, that would be the date, effective upon enactment, states would be barred from using any federal funding. Interestingly, it's not Planned Parenthood that's barred from the program, which several states have tried to do uh, and have failed to do. Instead, states would be prohibited from using the federal funds they get for, typically for family planning services, it's a 90-10 match. They could not make payments using federal funds to any quote-unquote prohibited entity. And when you read the description of a prohibited entity, the assumption is that there's really only one entity in the United States that, that, that meets the elements of the prohibition. Um, and that would be Planned Parenthood and its affiliates. Um, the prohibition on the use of federal funding would last a year. Um, I would remind you, of course, that the Hyde Amendment lasted a year. Uh, so I assume that this is the kind of thing that would be renewed each, and, yeah, each year. The Hyde Amendment's been around um, for what, 30 or 40, 40 years? 40, 40 yeah. years. And, um, <clears throat> you know, conceptually, Planned Parenthood could continue to provide services to a state's Medicaid beneficiaries, and the state could just simply pay and not seek federal financial participation. But this would be cumulative along with everything else that states will experience by way of funding loss. Now, the other shoe, of the two dropped shoes uh, here, the other shoe dropping, which is sort of the, um, uh, you know, the gauzy cover uh, is that the legislation also gives an additional $422 million to community health centers. Well, community health centers, and you have a lot of them in New Jersey, um, are family practices. So they do everything from, you know, babies to 90 year olds. Uh, and, and they do family planning services. Um, but there are a couple of complications. One is, that they have to do everything in their community. So the notion that you can just drop everything if you're a community health center and rush into the void created when their Planned Parenthood shut down uh, because it lost all its Medicaid revenues is, is probably incorrect. Um, and many, many health centers are coming forward um, in various states noting that they couldn't possibly do this. There's a wonderful New England Journal of Medicine article um, that chronicled the end of state funding for Planned Parenthood in Texas, the fact that health centers tried, they were told to try, they tried, and they just simply could not ramp up. So there's that practical problem. The funds um, would be made available to the federal government essentially with the year half over. The federal government would somehow have to get the funds out the door. The funds are not restricted to family planning. The funds are not restricted to community health centers in communities that had a family planning program that closed down, Planned Parenthood to close down. And so no matter how you slice it, even if, you know, with enough time and effort, maybe some health centers could ramp up their services in some communities, the, the loss of the Planned Parenthood services are immediate, it's immediate. It's the day of enactment. And, you know, it takes any health care provider months 
uh, if not years, to recover from a, the major loss of services in the community. So. so we kind of had a natural experiment in this already, and Heather's anticipating the question. <laughs> Governor Christie chose not to fund Planned Parenthood and said the same thing. The community health centers, and we increased funding, I think, to community health centers. That's right. What was the experience? So, well, so I think it actually, to, to then piggyback on Sarah's answer and to Lilo's question, so what we're talking about now is Medicaid reimbursement for right. services that people have at a parent parenthood clinic, whether it's a, you know, it could be an STD screening, it could be family planning. And they do a lot of cancer screenings. And they do a lot of cancer screenings, preventive health. Um, that's about, as I last saw, about 75% of the money that Planned Parenthood gets from governmental payers. Right. There's also the 25% that is general grants. And, and so that's what ties into what happened in New Jersey. That can be Title X funding that comes from the federal government and then uh, flows through the states to Planned Parenthood clinics. And, and then sometimes states supplement that with their own funding, which is the history here. And that's what was eliminated in New Jersey. Um, and then the argument was that the, that the um, that the FQHCs would be able to step in. And I don't think, and I think we've seen that movie and we know how it ends is that there was a diminishment of access to family planning. And we certainly saw Planned Parenthood um, office clinics closing and just sort of to finish the story then Sarah right so this this bill ends that Medicaid reimbursement for services right. there's a separate effort in Congress to defund that 25 percent grant program, the grant program right. as well mm -hmm. so it, it's certainly a, 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 an additional hit on Planned Parenthood is anticipated but but Leo to your question what we're, what's here is just that Medicaid piece that's about 75 percent of the right. governmental revenue does that make sense okay other questions? We have microphones on both sides. We were so clear. We have one there. We can always rely on Frank for a good question. Well, Introduce okay. yourself. Okay. Uh, Frank Thompson, uh, Center for State uh, Health Policy. Um, as I understand this bill, in, in terms of the per capita caps on Medicaid, the baseline uh, is 2000 and 16 states spent on the various categories of people, people with disabilities, the elderly, and so on and so forth. And I guess uh, my question is kind of a political one. The Times quoted Senator Rubio uh, uh, this morning saying, this is terribly unfair because Florida has spends relatively little uh, per capita in places like New York, or I suspect New Jersey spend quite a lot. Uh, Two-part question. Do you think this will be one of the, and, and going to Heather's food fight among states uh, point, do you think this could be a major stumbling block for passage in the Senate? And then any other comments you have, on any, any one of you? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I mean, the, I, think, I think in the Senate, the Senate leadership, is um, increasingly concerned about you know just how much much oxygen is being sucked out of the room. They've got the Gorsuch uh, hearing coming up. They are desperate to turn to tax policy. Uh, they have, in theory, a huge infrastructure measure to do, uh, and I would say it's not inconceivable. That, that everybody could decide that what makes practical sense now is to do a few pragmatic things to shore up the individual market, uh, to give states money, to, the flexibility fund to try and stabilize the, the, the premiums, uh, buy down some of the cost sharing, uh, maybe tinker with the age ratings, uh, tinker some with the, with the subsidies, the, the tax credits, the uh, premium credits. And, and, and do very little on Medicaid at this point. That is, that is possible, um, particularly if the demands around Medicaid that now appear to be about to make their entrance into the House bill um, and were kept out all this time because I think Speaker Ryan was trying to end up with a bill that while, you know, it, very tough on Medicaid, did not have sort of the dog whistles in it that he knew would sink it in the Senate. And McConnell even said when the story broke about the concessions that had been made in the House, uh, McConnell basically said, 
I was very happy with the, with the Medicaid bill as it stood. It had been negotiated by 10 governors, five expansion state governors, and five other governors. I'm sure they probably, the governors weren't thrilled with this, but it, they, they, it was the product of a negotiation. And clearly the governors themselves had kept out these, you know, very fiery issues. So it's, it's possible that we end up with a measure in the end where everybody agrees to just get rid of the Medicaid stuff, that it was a bridge too far. Um, because I don't know how, if the Senate refuses to, I, I can't believe the Senate would agree to the provisions that the House Republican Study Committee or group has now demanded, um, and the, the House Republicans that, who have demanded this would never agree to a conference bill that, that doesn't include these provisions. So that may be, <clears throat> that may be the end. I think, I think much effort was made at trying to convince the most extreme members that don't worry, we'll do this by 1115 demo. And interestingly, I mean, they just weren't waiting for, for states to, to, to see whether, in fact, people went along with 1115 demos. They wanted the stuff in the statute. Well, as, as far as the technical issue is concerned, this comes up all the time, actually, where the state said, oh, we were just about to double our spending, and then we would have gotten a lot more out of this. Uh, what you can do is say, uh, instead of making the baseline be just the state-specific baseline, you make it a weighted average of state-specific and some national or some other. And that, of course, blew Face up toward, 20 years ago. Yeah, right, that's yeah. what blew up the block grant yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah, but uh, still, you, uh, the, if, if you want to negotiate a, a compromise on it, they can, but they may not. Right. Sarah, could I ask a, just to follow up to that? Do you think it's plausible that the Senate, because it, as I said, I think it is striking that they not only went after the Medicaid expansion and the ACA, but went to this, this sort of fundamental change. Do you think one possibility is that they would keep in the cuts to the Medicaid expansion, but just sort of set aside the other per capita cap it, cuts? Yeah, I mean, there's sort of... Um, three buckets of stuff going on here now. There's the Medicaid expansion, and on that one, the world sort of, sort of split between, let's blow it up entirely, let's just take the funding away, and well, okay, we have to leave some funding, at least at the, at the normal um, federal contribution rate, but let's really make it uh, exhibit A in carrying out our behavioral modification uh, <laughs> agenda around poor people. Uh, as a friend of mine said, well, hopefully in the bill also will be a doubling of the minimum wage and, um, and, and a national tra a retraining program. Um, uh, so there is room for compromise. There is room for compromise. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the one bucket. And then, the, the, of course, then there's the per capita cap, which is just a fundamental redefinition of the, of the social compact between the federal and state government. Um, and then there is all this stuff like... Um, uh, churning the roles and time limits yeah. and yeah. show us your documents, you know, that's sort right. of another agenda. So which, which of these things stays in? There's been a fight for the soul of Medicaid, right? I, I'm in the middle of a paper uh, now about this, sort of a fight for the soul of Medicaid for 50 years. And basically the Affordable Care Act after the Affordable Care Act, a number of us, I mean myself included, said finally, 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 we recognize the program as health insurance. Mm -hmm. And now what we're seeing, of course, is, and it began with the Sebelius decision and has sort of gone downhill since then, is um, opponents of the program saying we're never going to let it be insurance. It's welfare. Mm -hmm. And so you're really stuck with this, you know, tremendous profound fight over what is the Medicaid program. And the problem is it's not a program for 11 million people anymore the way it was in 1980. It's a program for 75 million. So who cares what you call it at this point? It's right. the biggest insurance program we've got. Well, and it, it strikes me that, um, you know, I, I thought there would be an outpouring of support for, for uh, or uh, opposition to repeal because there are so many beneficiaries, but I've been struck by the sort of town hall rancor and, and people who really do look like Trump Republicans coming out. And, um, I wonder if others were surprised by that and will it make any difference in the House in particular that is just so disciplined now that if you look at the voting records of New Jersey moderate Republicans over the years, it has, they've fallen in line. So. 
uh, you know, is, is, there a, is there, I mean, do they just not have a voice anymore? It's interesting, so I have a colleague at Princeton who was arguing that politics used to be local. I'd love your take on this, Michael. Um, politics used to be local, and is politics all national now? And we've always thought healthcare was local, but is that, is it also national? So will, will folks revert to their partisan norm? Or, you know, yeah, or, that's kind of that, the question. That's, yeah, right. that's the. No, I, I mean, I think, and this is, we have to hold another panel, but, uh, we, you know, I think the issue of redistricting, I mean, one of the things that was striking, right, about the Democrats in 2008 compared to the early 1990s was how well they got in line. And some of this can be attributed to, well, we learned lessons about how we fell apart during the Clinton plan. Let's stick together. But I think a lot of this is sort of goes along more broadly what's happened in American politics of party line voting and hyperpartisanship, mm -hmm. which at its core, I think, it gets back to redistricting and safe districts uh, with, with fairly extreme positions. And so that tempers my optimism when I see people thinking, oh, people are going to be so angry at this and they look at the town halls. It's not clear to me, actually, how that's going to translate, even if people sort of put two and two together by the 2020 midterms or, or, or beyond. Uh, so I don't see a lot of incentive built in to radically shift away from the general direction. I think it's going to be negotiations at the margin. It's going to be, you know, negotiations between Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell, as it were, uh, in terms of whether or not you set some of the more radical changes to the Medicaid program aside and just really go after the ACA. But I don't see, I don't see the kind of rancor uh, um, in terms of the general public pushing back against this. Uh, I mean, we do well, see a it in strong, the, strong I mean, lobbying yeah. effort on the part of the hospitals and the nursing homes and the governors, yeah. maybe. Well, remember, too, uh, that there are people who are gaining from this. Uh, sure. the, most of us are probably gaining financially, although our consciences are no longer going to be as clean as they were before <laughs> because we'll be paying less taxes. And the low-risk people who are being overcharged for their insurance are gaining. They tend to be quieter than the people who are losing benefits. Right. But, uh, but I think in terms of the political, uh, 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 and even the older women, I don't know if there's going to be a coalition of older women to support the Republican bill. Boy, that would be a shock. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, it would be in their self-interest. Uh, but, uh, but I think that the, uh, the, the mix of gainers and losers is, 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 is pretty evenly split that probably the losers lose more per person than the right. gainers gain so per gonna... person, but in voting we kind of count heads as long as we can get them out to the polls. Yeah. Although, although in politics it's useful to remember that some older women do have a relationship with older men who are being harmed, so they may yeah, not be able that's that true, That's true, that's well, true. Although it's, the, it's the, widow, the widow society that I expect to see demonstrated. <laughs> well, I could keep going, but I promise questions, so Lisa. <laughs> Can you hear me? No. no. It, Magic, yeah. Oliver. Lisa Block with the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey. I'm an older woman. Um, <laughs> getting down to back to breast tax for a moment. Within the reconciliation bill, are there offsets that I need to know about um, in some safety net aspects through HRSA, uh, presumptive eligibility, mental health coverage? 340B, this has been shoring up many groups that um, the foundation supports in the Newark region, and of course, that's throughout the state. So I'm concerned what don't I know that could be negotiated away and further destabilize services and care. And I'll, I'll start with a couple of, I think those are good points. There is an increase in funding for the FQHCs, uh, $422 million, um, but as, as Sarah said, that, you know, that doesn't Turn a switch on the day that money is provided. Well, and it's it's 422 million across the whole country. Right. It's not that much. <laughs> and there, it, it it repeals the prevention and public health fund, which is something that people, public health community, um, was very supportive of. That was funding a lot of. That was actually funding a lot of core public health activities. And so, especially as, as uh, there's, there's been the effect of crowd out. So I think that that there's a real concern about right. undermining the public health safety net. And, and you mentioned, isn't hospital presumptive eligibility repealed? Gone. Gone. Yeah. Ho Hospital-based presumptive eligibility, meaning somebody comes in, I see a from the hospital industry out, and somebody comes in who's not covered but, is, but would be eligible for Medicaid, you 
present, you presumptively, uh, um, at New Jersey hospitals do this, enroll them, that is, ne that is repealed. Right, and, and, and remember, that's, that's huge for hospitals because when they're coming in, is when they have those really expensive episodes. Well, so maybe. now they're going to have the expensive episode, and three months later they'll get coverage. The other, the other thing maybe. that's gone is three months for ret retroactive eligibility, which is a one of these obscure things that's been in Medicaid for 50 years, but it's very important to safety net hospitals, actually. It lets you begin the date of coverage earlier than the month of application. Um, Missing from the bills, and it's sort of everybody, it's with the mystery, the two mystery items now are funds to extend CHIP, uh, not in, uh, and if you recall, part of the Affordable Care Act was a new fund to just to expand health centers, not in connection with Planned Parenthood defunding, but just to expand health centers. And it's pumped billions of dollars all over the country, including here in New Jersey, to expand health centers. Um, that fund was extended as part of the Medicare payment reform bill two years ago, it was along with CHIP, that both were in the same package. And that's not there. So, the, and that accounts for, we have a, a research, we have a, a survey out in the field now. Um, that fund has come to account for 70% of all the grant funds that health centers get. So they are looking, particularly health centers in expansion states, that of course have done well, right? A lot of, they have a lot of newly insured patients, they have grant funding, they've been able to add, I mean almost every center now has uh, dental services, mental health, ben, mental health benefits have expanded, substance abuse services have expanded. They are looking at extraordinary retrenchment and layoffs uh, as a result of the, you know, potentially the loss of the grant funds and now the loss of the Medicaid expansion population. Thank you. Alan, introduce yourself. Uh, Alan Monheit, uh, Rutgers School of Public Health. I have a question for Mark. Uh, Mark, you mentioned the lack of research on health outcomes from reform as uh, sort of uh, impeding the uh, support for tax uh, based financing uh, mm -hmm. for reform. But we know that, that there's at least some research that suggests that the financial risk protection aspect of the reforms has been positive, and could we not use that to try to garner support, or is the bad press regarding um, narrow networks and rising premiums uh, sort of negate that? Yeah, that's a good question. I've been trying to think about it myself using the introspectoscope. Uh, uh, I, I wonder, am I more concerned about my neighbor's health or their wealth when it comes to uh, a serious illness that potentially is treatable? And uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, I mean, one, uh, it's a, sort of a, a smarty pants remark, but it, it, but it's still true is, well, there are a lot of ways to go broke, not just with health bills, and we don't see a great outcry for government support for uh, low-income people's automobile collision insurance or even their life insurance, where you could make the argument and so forth, but it, but it does seem like that uh, for, again, taking the political, uh, if, for people who are in favor of the idea of everybody having insurance kind of regardless of the facts, the new set of facts that are now being uh, proposed are ones that say, don't worry that we can't show that it makes them healthier, let's show that it uh, makes them less likely to be uh, 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 poorer. Uh, the, I mean, the, Rand ex the, the Oregon experiment didn't have a significant effect on going bankrupt, but it did take a big chunk out of people's uh, income. And, uh, uh, and I, I think, uh, so again, uh, I'm back to the uh, researchers' uh, 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 final word on everything. Uh, more research is needed uh, on this subject, to, to not only to see what the financial consequences are, but the much more subtle issue of, and how much does that bother everybody else uh, when people don't have... Um, uh, uh, but, but have access to, according to the Republicans, uh, insurance that could protect them from financial risk but, uh, but end up uh, being subject to it. Although I would point out, um, for what they're worth, the public opinion polls have very high support for uh, Medicaid 
even among people who are self-identified Republicans, it's something like 50 percent support. Well, usually, the they don't carry the price tag. The, yeah, no. and some, and then some, then but there are polls that then say even if it raised your taxes, and of course Dollar the numbers come down, but it's still not insubstantial. In yeah. Tully, yeah. no, no, there's, there's, there, uh, thank goodness there are uh, kindly people in this country. But uh, <laughs> well, and beyond the, beyond the altruism, though, I mean, Colin Grogan's done some interesting work looking at attitudes toward Medicaid among uh, uh, subsets of the public, and it turns out that if you have an older relative who has benefited from Medicaid and long-term care services and supports, you're much more likely to support the program. Yep. And so, right. Well, I've got another one for you. We, Jose Pagan and I found that if you live in a town, you're an insured person, but you live in a town with a lot of uninsured people, the quality of care that's going to be available in your town is going to be seriously adversely affected. Totally, so absolutely. Even if you were Scrooge McDuck, right. uh, it actually would be worthwhile well, to you support. Should, you should uh, just move uh, to a more well-insured town, yeah. that's all. Yeah. That's all. Why you can move to a more well insured town, but who can afford to live in Princeton? You know? <laughs> I, I always have to, I always remember the call I got in 1995 in the middle of what was the raging battle over block granting Medicaid. Yes. Uh, my secretary came in and said, You have a call on the phone. Um, it's from uh, Majority Leader Livingston, Robert Liv Livingston, who was then the House Majority Leader. Uh, he later resigned, uh, uh, but he was on the phone to me, he'd been referred to me um, because a family member was in desperate need of Medicaid, mm -hmm. uh, and she had been denied Medicaid, and could he, could I help counsel the family on getting Medicaid? And I, of course, talked to him at length and tr tried to uh, help the, with the problem. But it was so obvious to me that he was unable to connect at all. Mm -hmm. The call to me um, and what he was at that point working on uh, in, in, uh, as a matter of federal policy it was quite, quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Other questions? We have one back here. No. no. No, it's on. I wasn't talking into it. Uh, Amanda Turcott. I'm a fellow in the Society of Actuaries. I'm chair of the Blue Wave Healthcare Committee and a chief product officer at Ostra. We're an inclusive insurance company serving folks within 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, I was just going to react to some of your comments on choice and how, uh, you know, increasing uh, competition in states is going to improve choice. Um, I've actually managed two closed blocks of individual health coverage from the 60s, 70s, and 80s that were actually in death spirals. Um, but, you know, those plans were issued at a time when we did have choice. You could be on your employer's plan or you could not be on your employer's plan and purchase insurance in the individual market. Um, at rates that were reasonable and affordable, you know, for folks with a, with a, you know, middle American income. Um, now that's not the case. I mean, if you're covered by employer health care, do you actually have a choice? Do you have a choice of what plan your provide your employer has offered? Um, and you know, do you get to do you really have a choice among plans? Um, what does increasing competition in the states mean? I mean, to me, it means that there's going to be increased competition um, among the health plans towards brokers to improve their compensation rates. Uh, and then those brokers are going to talk to employers and sell you know, the plans that, uh, that, that are most advantageous to them. Employers are going to purchase the plans that uh, impact their bottom lines the most uh, favorably. And then employees still have no choice. Um, and the individual health care market, you know, even in a state like New York where you see several plans available, none of those plans has any out-of-network coverage. You don't have the option to purchase a plan with out-of-network coverage because of the way the law in New York was structured and allowed those plans to exist. Um, so, you know, uh, I would just like challenge the concept that there is that improving competition is actually going to have a measurable impact on the choice to consumers in this highly disintermediated market. Response? I guess. Well, so obviously, if you only have one seller, uh, well, you can still have a lot of choice of different plans because they can offer a variety of plans. I, I think the 
the great virtue of competition is more to uh, try to hold down the cost. On the other hand, uh, I, I guess I would, I would uh, answer the challenge that uh, uh, most large employers do offer you some choice. We have four plans at Penn, ranging from a high deductible health plan to a gold-plated PPO. Um, and and the, here I'm using introspectoscope again, but I don't feel there's a major gap there. I choose the highest one, but I, if, I was, <laughs> if I was just starting as a healthy young employee, I might choose the high deductible plan, or if I was a evil can evil type, I might choose the high deductible plan. Uh, and and uh, at least our benefits people believe, uh, and uh, they're some of the nice people in the world and smartest too that the uh, benefits that firms offer is important in affecting how which firm people choose to work for so in some ways group health insurance works kind of like the public school you know you vote with your feet uh, you want a better school uh, well of course you can have a, maybe a private school but the, uh, the other thing somebody remarked I think when I was talking before you move to a different town with a better school uh, you move to a firm with a health plan that's uh, closer to what you like uh, now I will admit uh, even though I get up every morning and worry about health insurance, I realize everybody else doesn't. So it may be putting a lot of faith in uh, pe people to think that they can make these choices. Uh, but I guess I, this is this is a, a health economist joke. I hope you get it. Uh, there's there's everybody agrees. There's two things wrong with the American healthcare system. People don't understand uh, health insurance and probability in making their decisions, and they engage in adverse selection. That's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> These kind of one gives you here. adverse selection if you understand probability. So I don't know where it comes out, but I guess it's it's uh, th this then is an ideological question, and I think I preface my remarks by saying that if you like a market, this is the strongest argument for a market. It's what's the alternative, and the alternative is a a single option chosen by a, a, a set of people who you may or may not have much influence over as a citizen, as a, certainly as an individual, uh, and uh, which, re which rule of the game would you rather live under? And I guess I'd rather choose my own poison <laughs> rather than have someone else choose it for me. Although, although but not everybody feels that way. Although, it, although internationally, you, single payer versus a, or a single choice versus a kind of market competition isn't really the only the sort of range of choices you have, but I think it raises the interesting question, first of all, of what, what does it mean to have a choice and do you mm, have yep. the capacity to make a choice, but also what do you have a choice over? So a lot of the discussion is about choice over insurance and there's a lot of evidence that people care far less about choice over insurance product than they care about choice of provider, which is why some of the narrow network issues are extraordinarily important. Yep. So you may have you may have choices among insurance products and opt for high deductible if you prefer, for a variety of reasons, uh, either you're an evil Knievel or you simply just don't have as much uh, liquidity uh, and, and can't afford the money, um, but you may be, so you have that choice, but you don't have the choice over, over provider, which is, I think, more problematic for most people. So we have time for one or two more questions. If not, I have one or two more. Here, why don't we, we'll come back. You, you had your chance. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Limited supply of time, Alan. Hi, um, Evelyn Liebman from AARP. Thank you very much for the program today. Um, I'm going to try and sneak in two questions. One quick one. Uh, one two of, quick ones. Two quick ones. Um, <laughs> Obamacare eliminated the asset test in Medicaid. A very significant change, and I'm wondering what we're seeing with that uh, in the bill that the House is debating. And the second one is really directed at Heather in terms of um, where, what do you see for the role of the states um, as we kind of now move in a different direction and once this all shakes out? Well, that, that's a quick question, but it doesn't have a quick answer. Sarah, you wanted to? Yeah, no, on the, on the asset test, there's no, um, there, there's nothing to restore an asset test for the Magi population, the, 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 the population of low-income people whose eligibility is determined under the new methodology. Um, there, are, there is a six-page provision 
restructuring what to do with lottery winners, all three <laughs> yeah. of them, $80,000 or higher. It was like six pages out of 100 devoted to lottery winners. Uh, and um, then there is a provision, just a separate one, that you might have some interest in that bars states from liberalizing the home equity uh, standards uh, for helping people who are cash poor but have a home stay in their home and still get Medicaid. Um, they would be limited to uh, the uh, $500,000 value. They could not go up higher than that. And of course, in places like New Jersey and New England, this is a real problem for low-income people. And just a, a, a quick answer on states is I think states continue to be where the action is on uh, from the healthcare perspective, so uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the good and the bad news, I think, for the people in the room is that um, with, when you, you know, we will circle back to what we said about Medicaid. Now it's over 70 million people. It's one in three Californians. I think it's about one in four New Jerseyans. So states are buying healthcare for a substantial part of, of the of the population, and so have tremendous responsibility. And I st think states are finally coming more into their own in terms of trying to think about how they flex those But they muscles. still need more funding of technical assistance. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Well, from I, their, from I, their state universities and other universities. Right? I know, yeah. the, I know the answer to Sarah's question. Uh, Medic more generous Medicaid frees up money to play the lottery. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> right. Okay, thanks. So maybe one more. No more. I think we're done. Oh, Alan. Oh, wait. Oh, go ahead. We'll do two more. Okay. Make it fast. I will make it fast. So assuming uh, this hill goes nowhere, and as the president says, he will let the Affordable Care Act implode on its own, uh, what's the status of House versus Burwell? affecting the cost sharing uh, subsidies. Mm. Oh, yeah. By the way, this, so, this bill repeals the cost sharing subsidies. Right. Yeah. But, but the ACA right. right. Under, yeah. Right. So, House of course, the price. parties, this is the bill it's now House in versus which the price. House challenged the constitutionality right. of the president's expenditure of cost sharing subsidies. And rather than making them clearly permissible or, or allowable, the bill, of course, repeals the cost-sharing subsidies. The assumption is that um, uh, Congress, at a later point, um, might do something for uh, the plans uh, in an appropriations bill. The, the chances are what they're going to do um, is let it play out in terms of funding the stabilization, the back-end part. Uh, and upping the premiums and never come up with the cost sharing subsidies. But meanwhile, um, uh, you know, there, there are, of course, lawsuits pending brought by insurers that are demanding the money they were promised. Uh, and some of the lawsuits have tanked, but one big one having to do with the stabilization program, just one in Oregon, and the insurer got a $200 million judgment against the United States. Oh. So. It's not good, too, too late for the co-ops, no. but yeah. The, this issue of sort of yeah. rat, you know, pulling these levers to try and keep the market stable, it's still not totally clear to me. Uh, as Bullwinkle used to say, you know, <laughs> what's, what's the trick up his, their sleeve for keeping the market okay and participating. So last question. So glad I get the last question. Um, my name is Stephanie Albanese. I work for State Senator Joe Vitale, who, by nature of being the chairman of the Health Committee and uh, being a good human, has been working for three years on fighting the drug epidemic in the state and working on substance abuse issues and trying to bring relief to that suffering population. It's also a huge uh, issue for the governor. Um, and I just wonder, there's very obvious ways in which this bill would be terrible for that population, but I, you know, with access and coverage, you know, moving away. But I wonder if you see other specific ways in the bill that that population is going to have a really hard time if this goes forward. Thanks. Important question. Well, I mean, the, the big one is the loss of federal funding for the population of adults, poor adults, who have borne the brunt, I am sure. Uh, of this uh, of, 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 of this epidemic. Uh, uh, Virginia, for example, where I'm from, which is a non-expansion state, um, has only limited ability to use Medicaid to deal with the opioid crisis, although 
they just put a huge package together. And in fact, I used Virginia as kind of exhibit A of the problem of the per capita caps because the spending for their initiative is after the base year, which <laughs> means, you know, that they're ba they, they, even if you get, let the new eligibles go and you just want to ramp up funding for the traditional eligibles, you can't respond anymore to public health crises under a per capita system that doesn't have constant rebasing going on or exceptions for public health crises. So uh, with that, I, we'll, we have to wrap up. I'll remind you, you'll get an email. Please uh, give us your feedback. And please um, join me in thanking our wonderful panel. Uh, so I guess we'll conclude with the statement to be continued, right? It's, it's not over yet. Thank you all.